The Complete Visions of and Catherine Emmerich Jesus Still Taught and Cured in the Country Around the Inn The Neophytes, the pagan caravan, and many others took their way to the Jordan with the intention of crossing. The ferry was an hour and a half to the south of Bezek, below a city called Zarthan, which was one hour's distance from the first named, and lower down on the Jordan. On the opposite side of the river, between Bezek and Zarthan, was a place called Adam. It was near that city of Zarthan that the Jordan had ceased to flow while the children of Israel were crossing. Solomon once had some vases cast here. That industry was still carried on. West of the bend that the Jordan makes in this neighborhood was a mountain extending off to Samaria, and in it was a mine from which was obtained a metal something like that which we call brass. Jesus taught all along the route. When questioned as to whether he intended to teach in Zarthan, he answered, There are other localities that need it more. John was often there, so you may ask the people whether he feasted and lived on dainty fare. The Jordan was here crossed by a great ferry, just below which began the detour of the river toward the west. After crossing, Jesus and his followers went on for about two hours eastward and along the northern bank of a little stream that flowed into the Jordan somewhere below the ferry. Then they crossed another stream near which lay Sokoth to their left, looking as if they had just stepped over it. They rested under tents between Sokoth and Enon, which places may have been about four hours apart. If they had again crossed the river and gone up a little distance, they could have seen Salem, which was hidden from them by the hilly bank. It was opposite Enon, and somewhat below the middle of another bend of the Jordan westward. Crowds innumerable were collected at Enon. The pagans were encamped between the hill upon which it was built, and the Jordan. There were ten Pharisees present, some from Enon, some from other places, among them the son of Simeon of Bethania. Some of them were reasonable enough, and animated by upright intentions. The little city of Enon lay on the north side of the hill, as if built up entirely of beautiful villas. On this side and beyond the city was the source of the basin destined for baptism, which was on the east side of the hill. The stream was conducted through the hill in metal pipes, which could be closed and opened when needed. There was a spring house over the source. The Pharisees, among them the son of Simon the leper, came out to this place to meet Jesus and the disciples. They welcomed them cordially and politely, led them into a tent, washed their feet, brushed their garments, and presented them refreshments of honey, bread, and wine. Jesus congratulated them on the good dispositions of many among them though, as he said, it grieved him that they belonged to that sect. He accompanied them to the city where he soon came to a court in which a crowd of sick of all kinds, some natives of the city, some strangers, were awaiting his arrival. Some were lying under tents, others were in the halls that opened into the court. Many could walk, and Jesus helped them one after another with imposition of hands and words of admonition. The disciples assisted in bringing the sick forward, in raising them and freeing them from their covers, etc. The Pharisees and many others were present. Several women stood at a distance, pale and enveloped in their mantles. They were afflicted with an issue of blood. When Jesus had finished with the rest, he approached them, laid his hands upon them, and cured them. Among the sick were paralytics and dropsical, consumptives, some with abscesses on their necks and other parts of the body, though not such as to render them unclean, the deaf and the dumb, in a word, sufferers of all kinds. At the extremity of this court was a large portico opening into the city. I saw in it many spectators, Pharisees and women. To the Pharisees of Enon, since there were upright souls among them and also because they had received him frankly and respectfully, Jesus showed a certain indulgence that he had not exhibited in other places. He wished thereby to make void the reproach that he associated only with publicans, sinners, and vagrants. He wanted to show them that he would pay them due honor if they demeaned themselves properly, and with upright intentions. They showed great activity in preserving order among the people on this occasion, and Jesus allowed them to do it. While Jesus was busy curing the sick, a beautiful woman of middle age and in the garb of a stranger entered the large portico by the gate leading from the city. Her head and hair were wound in a thin veil woven with pearls. She wore a bodice and shaped somewhat like a heart, and open at the sides, something like a scapular thrown over the head and fastened together around the body by straps reaching from the back. Around the neck and breast it was ornamented with cords and pearls. 
From it fell, in folds to the ankle, two deep skirts, one shorter than the other. Both were of fine white wool embroidered with large, colored flowers. The sleeves were wide and fastened with armlets. To the shoulder straps that connected the front and back of the bodice was attached the upper part of a short mantle that fell over the arms. Over this flowed a long veil of the whiteness of wool. The woman, ashamed and anxious, entered slowly and timidly, her pale countenance bespeaking confusion and her eyes red from weeping. She wanted to approach Jesus, but the crowd was so great that she could not get near him. The Pharisees keeping order went to her, and she at once addressed them, Lead me to the prophet, that he may forgive my sins and cure me. The Pharisees stopped her with the words, Woman, go home. What do you want here? The prophet will not speak to you. How can he forgive you your sins? He will not busy himself with you, for you are an adulteress. When the woman heard these words, she grew pale, her countenance assumed a frightful expression, she threw herself on the ground, rent her mantle from top to bottom, snatched her veil from her head and cried, Ah, then I am lost. Now they lay hold of me. They are tearing me to pieces. See, there they are. And she named five devils who were raging against her, one of her husband, the other four of her paramours. It was a fearful spectacle. Some of the women standing around raised her from the ground and bore her wailing to her home. Jesus knew well what was going on, but he would not put the Pharisees of this place to shame. He did not interfere, but quietly continued his work of healing, for her hour had not yet come. Soon after, accompanied by the disciples and Pharisees, and followed by the people, Jesus went through the city to the hill upon which John had formerly taught. It was in the center of moss-covered ramparts, and there were some buildings around. On the side by which they approached was a half-ruined castle, in one of whose towers Herod took up his abode during John's teaching. The whole hill was already covered with the expectant crowd. Jesus mounted to the place where John had taught. It was covered with a large awning open on all sides. Here he delivered a long discourse in which he spoke of the mercy of God to men, particularly to his own people. He ran through the entire scriptures, showed God's guidance of his chosen nation, his promises to them, and proved that they were all being realized in the present. Jesus did not, however, say so openly at Enon as he had done at Bezek that he was himself the Messiah. He spoke also of John, his imprisonment, and his mission. One crowd of listeners was at intervals supplanted by another, that all might hear his words. Jesus questioned some of them as to why they wanted to receive baptism, why they had put it off till the present, and what they thought the ceremony to be. He divided them into classes, some of which were to be baptized at once, and others only after further instruction. I remember the answer of one group of neophytes to the question why they had delayed till now. One of the number said, because John constantly taught that a man was to come who would be greater than himself. We waited consequently in order to receive still greater grace. At these words, all that approved the response raised their hands. They formed a special class to receive more particular instructions as preparation for baptism. The discourse ended at about three o'clock in the afternoon. Then Jesus and the disciples went with the Pharisees down the hill and into the city where a great entertainment had been prepared for him in one of the public halls. But when he drew near the hall, he stopped short, saying, I have another kind of hunger. And he asked, though he already knew, where that woman lived whom they had sent away from him in the morning. They pointed out the house. It was near the hall of entertainment. Jesus left his companions standing where they were, while he went forward and entered the house through the courtyard. As Jesus approached, I saw the fearful torture and affliction of the woman inside. The devil, who had possession of her, drove her from one corner to another. She was like a timorous animal that would hide itself. As Jesus was traversing the court and drawing near to where she was, she fled through a corridor and into a cellar in the side of the hill upon which her house was built. In it was a vessel like a great cask, narrow above and wide below. She wanted to hide herself in it but when she tried to do so, it burst with a loud crash. It was an immense earthen vessel. Jesus meantime halted and cried, Mary of Subhan, wife of, here he pronounced her husband's name, which I have forgotten, I command thee in the name of God to come to me. Then the woman, 
enveloped from head to foot, as if the demon forced her still to hide in her mantle, came creeping to Jesus' feet on all fours, like a dog awaiting the whip. But Jesus said to her, Stand up. She obeyed, but drew her veil tightly over her face and around her neck as if she wanted to strangle herself. Then said the Lord to her, Uncover thy face. And she unwound her veil, but lowering her eyes and averting them from Jesus as if forced to do so by an interior power. Jesus, approaching his head to hers, said, Look at me, and she obeyed. He breathed upon her. A black vapor went out of her on all sides, and she fell unconscious before him. Her servant maids, alarmed by the loud bursting of the cask, had hurried thither and were standing nearby. Jesus directed them to take their mistress upstairs and lay her on a bed. He soon followed with two of the disciples that had accompanied him, and found her weeping bitter tears. He went to her, laid his hand on her head, and said, Thy sins are forgiven thee. She wept vehemently and sat up. And now her three children entered the room, a boy about twelve years old, and two little girls of about nine and seven. The girls wore little short-sleeved tunics embroidered in yellow. Jesus stepped forward to meet the children, spoke to them kindly, asked them some questions, and gave them some instruction. Their mother said, Thank the prophet. He has cured me. Whereupon the little ones fell on the ground at Jesus' feet. He blessed them, led them one by one to their mother, in order of age, and put their little hands into hers. It seemed to me that, by this action, Jesus removed from the children the disgrace, and thus legitimatized them, for they were the fruits of adulterous unions. Jesus still consoled the woman, telling her that she would be reconciled with her husband, and counseling her thenceforth to live righteously in contrition and penance. After that he went with the disciples to the entertainment of the Pharisees. This woman was from Saphan in the land of Moab. She was a descendant of Orpha, the widow of Chalion, and daughter-in-law of Noemi, who upon the latter's advice did not go with her to Bethlehem, though Ruth, the widow of Orpha's other son Mahalan, accompanied Noemi thither. Orpha, the widow of Chalion, who was the son of Elimelech of Bethlehem, married again in Moab, and from that union sprang the family of Mary the Siphonite. She was a Jewess and rich, but an adulteress. The three children that she had with her at the time of her conversion were illegitimate. Her legitimate children had been retained by their father when he repudiated his unfaithful wife, their mother. She was living at this time in a house of her own at Enon. For a long time she had conceived sentiments of sorrow for her disorders and had done penance, her conduct being so reserved and proper that she had won the esteem of even the most respectable women of Enon. The Baptists preaching against Herod's unlawful connection had strongly affected her. She was often possessed by five devils. They had again seized upon her when, as a last resource, she had gone to the court where Jesus was curing the sick. The rebuff of the Pharisees and their words, which in her deep dejection she had taken as true, had driven her to the brink of despair. Through her descent from Orpha, Ruth's sister-in-law, she was connected with the house of David, the ancestral line of Jesus. It was shown me how this stream, deviating in her from its course and troubled by her abominable sins, was purified anew in her by the grace of Jesus and flowed once more in its direct course toward the church. Jesus went into the entertainment hall in which were the Pharisees and the rest of the disciples, and took his place with them at table. The Pharisees were somewhat displeased that Jesus had left them and gone to seek the woman whom they had so harshly repulsed that morning before so many people. But they said nothing, fearing to receive a reproof themselves. Jesus treated them with much consideration during the meal, and taught in numerous similitudes and parables. Toward the middle of the entertainment, the three children of the Siphonite entered in their holiday dresses. One of the little girls bore an urn full of odoriferous water, the other had a similar one of nard, and the boy carried a vessel. They entered the hall by the door opposite the unoccupied side of the table, cast themselves down before Jesus, and set their presents on the table in front of him. Mary herself followed with her maids, but she dared not approach. She was veiled, and carried a shining crystal vase with colored veins like marble in which, surrounded by upright sprays of delicate green foliage, were various kinds of costly aromatics. Her children had offered similar vases, but smaller. The Pharisees cast forbidding glances upon the mother and children. 
But Jesus said, Draw near, Mary. And she stepped humbly behind him, while her children, to whom she had handed it, deposited her offering beside the others on the table. Jesus thanked her. The Pharisees murmured as later on they did at Magdalene's present to Jesus. They thought it a great waste, quite opposed to economy and compassion for the needy. However, they only wanted something to bring against the poor woman. Jesus spoke to her very kindly, as also to the children, to whom he presented some fruit which they took away with them. The Siphonite remained veiled and standing humbly behind Jesus. He said to the Pharisees, All gifts come from God. For precious gifts, gratitude gives in return what it has the most precious, and that is no waste. The people that gather and prepare these spices must live. Then he directed one of the disciples to give the value of them to the poor, spoke some words upon the woman's conversion and repentance, restored her to the good opinion of all, and called upon the inhabitants of the city to treat her affectionately. Mary spoke not a word, but wept quietly under her veil the whole time. At last she cast herself in silence at Jesus' feet, rose, and left the dining hall. Jesus took this occasion to give some instruction against adultery. Which among them, he asked, felt himself free from spiritual adultery. He remarked that John had not been able to convert Herod, but that this poor woman had of her own accord turned away from her evil life, and then he related the parable of the sheep lost and found. He had already consoled the woman in her own house, assuring her that her children would turn out well, and holding out to her the hope that she should one day join the women under Martha's supervision and work for the benefit of the inns. I saw the disciples after the entertainment giving abundantly of what was left to the poor. Jesus then went down to the west side of the hill of Enon where the camp of the heathens lay at some distance. There was also, I think, a tent in on this side. There Jesus instructed the heathens. Enon was in the dominion of Herod, but it belonged, like a property across the boundary, to the tetrarch Philip. Many soldiers of Herod were again there trying to find out news for their master. From Enon Jesus went with twelve disciples to the Jabbok and the neighboring places. Andrew, James, John, and some other disciples remained at Enon, in order to baptize at the pool of baptism east of the hill. The water ran from the hill into the baptismal basin, formed a little lake behind it, watered some meadows as a little brook, and then fell into a reservoir on the north of Enon from which it could be turned at pleasure into the Jordan. I saw Jesus with the disciples teaching in a city about one hour east of Sokoth and on the south side of the Jabbok. Among the numerous sick that he healed was a man who since his birth had one eye closed, Jesus moistened it with his saliva. The eye opened, and the man enjoyed perfect sight. Jesus crossed the Jabbok, which flows through a valley, and turned to the east until he came into the vicinity of Mahanaim, a nice, clean city in two sections. He sat down by the well outside, and soon out came the elders of the synagogues and the chief men of the city with goblets, food, and drink. They bade Jesus welcome, washed his and the disciples' feet, poured ointment on Jesus' head, gave him and the disciples a little luncheon, and conducted him with great love and simplicity into the city. Jesus delivered a short discourse upon the patriarch Jacob and of all that had happened to him in those parts. Most of these people had been baptized by John. A patriarchal simplicity reigned in all the cities around this region, and many of the ancient customs were still observed. Jesus did not tarry long here, only time enough to receive the honors paid him on his route. From Mahanaim he went along the northern bank of the Jabbok for about an hour eastward to the place where Jacob and Esau met. The valley here sinks deep. During the whole way Jesus taught his disciples. After some time they recrossed to the southern bank not far from where two little streams united to form the Jabbok. Then they continued their journey for about a mile to the east with the desert of Ephraim on their right. After traversing the valley they found, upon a mountain ridge to the east of the forest of Ephraim, Ramoth Galad, a beautiful city, clean and regularly built. In it the heathens had their own quarter and temple. The sacred services were celebrated by Levites. One of the disciples went on ahead to announce Jesus' approach. The Levites and others of distinction were already awaiting him in a tent near the well outside the city. They washed the newcomer's feet, gave them the usual refreshments as a pledge of hospitality, and conducted them into the city. There they found a crowd of poor sick gathered on an open square to implore Jesus' help. 
he cured many of them. That evening he taught in the synagogue, for it was the beginning of the Sabbath that commemorated the sacrifice of Jephthah's daughter, which in this city was celebrated as a morning and national festival. There were crowds of young maidens and other people from the country around. Jesus and the disciples took a repast with the Levites and stayed overnight in a house near the synagogue. There were in these parts no special inns prepared for Jesus. In Enon, Cayman, and Mahanaim they were hired in advance, and the number of guests limited. Ramoth was built in terraces on a hill behind which, in a little vale flanked by a steep, rocky wall, was the quarter of the city inhabited by the pagans. They had a temple. One could always recognize their abodes by the figures erected on the roofs. On the roof of this temple was a whole group. The central figure wore a crown and stood in a reservoir or fountain, holding a basin in its hand. Around it were several figures of children dipping up the water and pouring it from one to another until at last it fell into the basin held by the middle finger. The cities in this region were more beautiful, more neatly built than the old Jewish ones. The streets were laid off in the form of a star, all verging to a central point, and the extremities were rounded, thus making the circumference assume something of a zigzag form, as did also the city walls. Ramoth Galad was formerly a city of refuge for criminals. There was a large solitary building in which they were lodged, but at the time of Jesus' visit it had fallen to ruin and appeared to be no longer used. They made tapestry here, embroidered with figures of all kinds of animals and flowers, partly for trade, and partly for the use of the temple. I saw numbers of women and young maidens working at it in long tents. The costume of the people resembled more the patriarchal style, and they were very clean. Their clothing was of fine wool. Jesus assisted at a solemn memorial feast of the sacrifice of Jephthah's daughter. He went with his disciples and the Levites to a beautiful open square outside the city to the east where preparations for the festival had been made. The inhabitants of Ramoth Galad were already assembled and ranged in large circles. Here were still the hill and the altar upon which Jephthah's daughter was immolated. In front of it was a semicircle of grassy seats for the maidens, and nearby were seats for the Levites and magistrates of the city. All went in a long and orderly procession to their places. The young girls of Ramoth and many from the neighboring cities assisted at the feast in robes of mourning. One young girl, clothed in white and veiled, persona Ted Jephthah's daughter herself. A troop of others clad in somber robes, their faces veiled to the chin and wearing black, fringed sashes on the forearm, represented her lamenting companions. Tiny girls scattering flowers and playing on little flutes mournfully headed the procession in which three lambs were led. The ceremonies were long and of the most touching nature. They comprehended different parts, chanting, religious instructions, and representations of the sad drama, while psalms and songs commemorative of it were sung. The maiden that persona Ted Jephthah's daughter was comforted and lamented in chorus by her companions, though she herself was sighing only after death. Among the Levites also in some of the choirs of singers, there seemed to be held a conference upon the heroine's fate, but she presented herself before them and in earnest words begged to be allowed to accomplish the vow. They made use of different roles of writing in the different scenes, some parts being recited from memory, others read from the roles. Jesus took an active part in the celebration. He personated the supreme judge, or high priest, and besides the speeches assigned his role, he delivered instructions before and during the ceremonies. Three lambs were sacrificed in memory of Jephthah's daughter, their blood sprinkled around the altar, and the roasted flesh given to the poor. Jesus gave the young maidens some words of instruction on the danger of yielding to vanity. I understood from it that Jephthah's would have been liberated had she not been so vain. The feast lasted until afternoon. During the whole celebration, the maidens successively replaced one another in personating Jephshas. As soon as one finished her part, the next in order rose from the stone seat upon which she had been sitting in the midst of the circle, retired with her into a tent nearby, and assumed the costume of the victim, that worn by her at the moment of immolation. The tomb of the young heroine was on a neighboring hill, and on it the lambs were sacrificed. It was a four-cornered sarcophagus opening on top, when the fat of the lambs and the other portions to be sacrificed were almost consumed, what was left of the victims was introduced slantingly into the opening, that with the ashes it might fall into the tomb. When the lambs were slaughtered I saw the blood sprinkled around the altar, 
and the maiden's putting, with a little rod, a drop of it on the end of the long, narrow veil hanging over their shoulder. Jesus said, Jephshas, Thou shouldst have thanked God in the retirement of thine own home for the victory he had granted thy people. But becoming vain and seeking praise as a hero's daughter, thou didst with frivolous ornaments and festive sounds go forth boasting before the other daughters of the land. When the festive ceremonies were ended, all retired to a pleasure garden nearby where arbors and tents had been erected and an entertainment prepared. Jesus took part in it. He placed himself at the table at which the poor were fed, and related a parable. The maidens ate in the same tent, but separated from the others by a screen about three feet high. Lying at table, one could not see over it, though to one standing, it did not obstruct the view. After the meal Jesus with the Levites, the disciples, and many others returned to the city, where numbers of sick were patiently awaiting his coming. He cured them, as well as some lunatics and others afflicted with melancholy. He taught in the synagogue, taking for his subject Jacob and Joseph and the selling of the latter to the Egyptians. He said, One day another also shall be sold by one of his brethren. But he will pardon his penitent brethren and in the time of famine feed them with the bread of eternal life. On that same evening, some of the pagans outside the city accosted the disciples very humbly, asking them whether they too might hope to share in the great prophet's teachings. The disciples informed Jesus of their desire, and he promised to go to them in the morning. Jeft was the natural son of an idolatrous mother. Driven by his father's legitimate children from Ramoth, called also Masfa, he lived in the neighboring land of Tob. He joined some military adventurers and led a life of brigandage, his pagan wife died young, leaving him an only daughter, who was beautiful and extraordinarily talented, but rather given to vanity. Jeft was an exceedingly rash, absolute, and determined man, eager for victory, and strongly wedded to his own word. He was more like a pagan hero than a Jew. He was an instrument in the hand of God. Fired with desire to conquer and rule the land from which he had been expelled, he made that solemn vow to offer to the Lord as a holocaust the first one that should come out of his own house on his victorious return. He dreamed not that it would be his only daughter, as for the rest of his family, he had no love for them. Jephthah's vow was not pleasing to God, nevertheless he permitted it, decreeing that its fulfillment should be a chastisement upon both father and daughter, and cut off the posterity of the former from Israel. His daughter would perhaps have been perverted by the success and elevation of her father, but as it was, she did penance during two months and died for God. It is probable that she also influenced her father to a better way of thinking and made him more faithful to God. The daughter went out followed by a long train of maidens with songs and flutes and timbrels to meet her father. It was at a whole hour's distance from the city that she met him, still she was the first whom he saw belonging to his own family. When she discovered her misfortune, she entered into herself and asked for a reprieve of two months, that she might retire into solitude to prepare by penance for her sacrifice, and to mourn with her companions over her virginal death, which would deprive her father of posterity in Israel. With several of her young companions she went into the mountains opposite the valley of Ramoth, where for two months she dwelt under a tent in prayer, fasting, and sackcloth. The maidens of Ramoth took turns in staying with her, she mourned especially her vanity and thirst for glory. The rulers held counsel as to whether she could be freed from death, but it was not possible since her father had sworn a solemn oath. It was consequently a vow that could in no wise be commuted. I saw too that the daughter herself desired its fulfillment, and petitioned for it in words both wise and touching. Her sacrifice was accompanied by every mark of grief, her companions chanting songs of mourning around her. She was seated on the same spot upon which the memorial feast was celebrated. Here again a council was held for the purpose of delivering her from death, but stepping forward she expressed her wish to die, just as I had seen at the feast. She was clothed in a long, white garment that closely enveloped her from the breast to the feet, but from her head to her breast she wore a transparent, white veil through which could be seen her face, neck, and shoulders. She walked courageously to the altar. Her father hurried from the scene without bidding her adieu. Then she drank something red from a vessel presented her. I think it was something to render her unconscious. One of Jephthah's warriors was deputed to give the death blow. 
His eyes were bandaged as a sign that he did not incur the guilt of murder, since he would not see the blow that was to kill the victim. She was then laid on his left arm, and he pierced her throat with a short, sharp weapon. She had no sooner drunk the red liquid than it produced its effect, for she was perfectly unconscious when laid on the warrior's arm. Two of her young companions, who also were in white and appeared to act as bridesmaids, caught the blood in a dish and poured it on the altar. She was afterward enveloped by her companions in a winding sheet and laid at full length on the altar, the upper surface of which was grated. A fire was kindled below and, when her garments were burned and the whole looked like a blackened mass, some men raised the grate with the corpse upon it. They rested the grate upon the edge of an open tomb nearby, and then gently raising the grate, let the body slide down into it. The tomb was then closed. It was still to be seen even in Jesus' time. The companions of Jephshaz and many of the assistants steeped their veils and handkerchiefs in her blood, while others gathered up the ashes of the Holocaust. Before Jephshaz made her appearance in her sacrificial habiliments, her young companions had retired with her into a tent where she bathed and was prepared for the ceremony. It was to the north of Ramoth, over two hours' distance in the mountains that Jephshaz and her companions met her father. They were mounted upon little asses adorned with ribbons and hung with tinkling bells. One rode in front of Jephshaz, one on either side, and the rest followed with songs and music. They sang the canticle of Moses upon the defeat of the Egyptians. As soon as Jeff descried his daughter, he rent his garments and became inconsolable. Jephshaz herself did not give way to grief, but learned with calmness the fate that awaited her. When she and her companions left her father's house for the wilderness, taking with them such food only as was allowed for a fast, Jeff spoke to his daughter for the last time. This was in a certain manner the beginning of the sacrifice. At the moment of parting, he laid his hand, as was customary in offering sacrifice, upon his daughter's head with the simple words, Go forth. Thou wilt never have a spouse. To which she responded, No, I shall never have a spouse. And he never again spoke to her. After his daughter's death, Jeff had a beautiful monument erected in Ramoth and a little temple built over it. He ordered a memorial festival to be annually celebrated on the anniversary of his daughter's immolation as a remembrance of his sad vow and a warning to others against such rashness. Jephthah's mother was a pagan who had been converted to Judaism. His wife was the daughter of a man born from the illicit union of a Jew with an idolatress. On his expulsion from his native place, his daughter did not accompany him. She remained in Ramoth where, meanwhile, her mother died. When, in time of danger, Jeft was recalled to Tob by his compatriots, he did not return into the city of his birth. He assembled the people and concerted measures with them in the camp outside of Masfa. His own home and his only daughter he did not see. When he made that vow, he never thought of her, but of his other relatives who had repudiated him, and therefore God punished him. The feast lasted four days. Jesus with his disciples visited also the pagan quarters in Ramoth. The people met him with marks of reverence at the head of their street. Not far from their temple was an open-air space used for public discourses. Several of the sick and aged had been brought thither, the former of whom Jesus healed. They that had solicited a visit from him appeared to be learned men, priests, and philosophers. They knew about the journey of the three kings, and of their having seen the birth of the king of the Jews and the stars, for they had a similar expectation and were likewise engaged in the observation of the stars. Not far from here was a kind of observatory similar to that in the land of the holy three kings, and from it they gazed at the stars. They had long sighed for instruction, and now they received it from Jesus himself. He spoke to them of very profound mysteries, even of the most holy trinity. I heard these words that especially astonished me. He spoke of the fall of man, of the promised Redeemer, of the guidance of mankind, of the deluge, of the passage through the Red Sea and the Jordan, and of baptism. He told them that the Jews had not obtained entire possession of the promised land, that many heathens still dwelt therein, but that he was now come to take possession of all that remained and united to his kingdom not, however, by the sword, but by charity and grace. His words made so deep an impression upon many of his hearers that he sent them to Enon to be baptized. Seven aged men that could no longer travel, 
Jesus allowed to be baptized at once by two of the disciples. A basin was brought and placed before them while they stood up to the knees in the water and a bathing cistern near at hand. Above the basin was placed a railing upon which they could lean. Two of the disciples laid their hands on the neophyte's shoulders while Matthias, a disciple of John, poured on their heads, one after another, water from a shell at the end of which was a handle. Jesus dictated to the disciples the form of words they should use. The old men were clothed in beautiful white garments, all very neat and clean. Then Jesus gave an instruction to the people in general, taking for his subject chastity and marriage. To the women he spoke especially of obedience, of humility, and the education of their children. These people were well disposed. They conducted Jesus most affectionately back to the Jewish quarter, where he went to the synagogue and healed the sick that he found before it. The Levites were not well pleased at Jesus having visited the heathens. In the synagogue, where Jephthah's festival was still being celebrated, Jesus taught of the call of the Gentiles. He said that many of them would rank higher in his kingdom than the children of Israel, and that he was come to unite with the rightful possessors of the promised land, by grace, instruction, and baptism, the idolaters whom the Israelites had not expelled. He spoke also of Jephthah's victory and vow. While Jesus was preaching in the synagogue, the maidens were celebrating their feast at the monument that Jephthah had erected to his daughter. It had been rebuilt, and every year at the recurrence of the festival was beautified by the contributions of the young girls. It stood in a round temple with an opening in the roof. In the center of this temple was a smaller one of the same form. It consisted of a kind of cupola supported by columns, in one of which was concealed a staircase leading up to it. Around the cupola wound a spiral walk upon which was a representation of the triumphal procession of Jephshas, the figures being the height of a child. This piece of workmanship was of light material, but shining like polished metal. The base supporting it was of open work, through which the figures appeared to be gazing down into the little temple. The top of the cupola was crowned by a circular, metal platform from which a kind of ladder, consisting of a pole with projecting rods on either side, led up to the roof of the exterior temple. From this roof the view over the city and surrounding country was very extended. The platform at the top of the ladder was wide enough to allow two girls holding on to the pole to make a turn around it hand in hand. A pedestal in the center of the smaller temple supported a white marble figure of Jephthah's daughter seated on a chair of the same material, just as she appeared before her immolation. Her head reached to the first coil of the spiral-shaped cupola. Around the base of the statue, there was space enough for three men to walk abreast. The columns surrounding the little temple were connected together by beautiful grates. The exterior was of stone veined in different colors. The coils of the cupola varied in degrees of whiteness from bottom to top, the upper ones of the purest white. In the temple around this monument, the young girls now celebrated Jephshah's feast. The maiden statue held a handkerchief to the eyes with one hand as if shedding tears, while the other hanging listlessly at her side held a flower or broken branch. The young girl's celebration was conducted with order. Sometimes they stretched curtains from the outer circle of the temple to the interior of the monument, and took their places in little groups apart to pray and sigh and mourn in silence, their eyes fixed on the statue. Sometimes they sang together in chorus, sometimes in alternate choirs. Again, they passed two by two before the statue, strewing flowers, adorning it with wreaths and, as if to console Jephshah's, chanting hymns on the shortness of life. I remember the expressions, Today for me, Tomorrow for thee. Then they sang the praises of Jephshah's fortitude and resignation, lauding her highly as the price of their victory. Then they mounted in groups by the serpentine walk up to the top of the cupola where they sang triumphal songs. Some went up to the roof of the exterior temple, looked out over the country as if to catch a glimpse of the conquering hero, and pronounced the fearful vow. The procession then returned lamenting to the monument, mourned over the young virgin, and consoled her on the privation of the privileges of maternity. The exercises were interspersed with canticles of thanksgiving to God and reflections upon his justice, the various scenes being accompanied by very touching pantomimes, expressive by turns of joy, grief, and devotion. A grand entertainment was prepared for the young girls in the temple. I saw them not reclining at one table, but sitting in tiers of three, one above another, all around the temple, 
with little round tables at their side. They sat cross-legged. They had all kinds of wonderful dishes and viands made up into figures for instance, that of a lamb lying on its back and filled with fruit and other eatables. Let's pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now, and at the hour of death. Amen.